I don't believe that honor is something that really you can teach. I think it's something that grows in a person and it's something that is by their actions. Hello, you're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 520, with today's guest, Caden Gad. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm Whistlekick's founder and host here for the show. And if you're unfamiliar, everything we do at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find everything we're doing. And one of the things that we're doing, well, we've got a store. We've got some products that we make. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you can save 15% on a shirt or a hat or a training program. It's a bunch of good stuff over there. This show gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and we bring you two new episodes every single week, all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists worldwide. If you want to support that work, there are a number of ways you can help us. You can make a purchase. You could share this episode. You could follow us on social media. You could tell a friend about what we're doing here at Whistlekick on the show. Pick up one of our books at Amazon, leave a review on Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Google, somewhere, or you could support the Patreon. If you think the new shows that we're doing are worth 63 cents a piece, not to mention all the back episodes, consider supporting us at $5 a month. You could do as little as two, you could do as much as a hundred, but $5 a month, that's where most people end up. If you go to patreon.com slash whistlekick and sign up there, if you do, we're going to give you more content. We don't talk about this too often. I don't like turning the show into a big commercial. But bottom line, the show costs money. And if you're willing to step up and help us out, we're willing to give you even more. Today's guest is, well, I guess I'd call him a man of the sword. It's an interesting conversation. It's one that doesn't follow a path like we've had before. And I know I say that often. And maybe it's just because I'm continually blown away at the diversity of the guests that we have, the uniqueness of their experiences. I think you will be too today. This was a good one. And I hope you enjoy it. Caden Gadd, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Jeremy, thank you very much for having me. Hey, thanks for coming on. Thanks Thanks for doing this. We've been chatting for over 15 minutes now. It doesn't usually happen this way. Usually, and, and this, I, this is a good thing, you know, uh, audience, I want to let you know, I was warned at the beginning uh, that, that our guest is, is blunt and, and might not respond with long-winded answers. But I have to say, sir, everything that you just said kind of contradicts that. <laughs> well, I'm certain <laughs> we that just you had a great conversation. A, glad you feel that way. And I'm just as certain as you will run into it during this conversation. But hey, we will make it through just fine. We will. We will. It's, uh, it's like everybody's first martial arts class. You show up and it doesn't matter how many you've watched. It doesn't matter how many people you've talked to about it. It's still, there's still a little bit of uh, uncertainty when you start and, and the instructor can sit there and pretty much hold your hand and you're still going to feel uncertain for that, that hour. Hmm. A lot of synergy there. And I, I, you know, it's weird. We're 500 some episodes in and I just picked up on that. Wow. Now, of course, we're here to talk about martial arts, and we're going to talk about a lot of things related to martial arts. And I found that the best way to start is to just roll the tape back. So if you would indulge me with probably the most simplistic question I could ask you, how did you get started in martial arts? Love to fight. I, I, you know, my earliest memory of being a, a, a kid, uh, being in a fight, my first fight was I simply wanted to fight someone. And I don't have a lot of the peaceful harmony desire to become a martial artist that other people have had. We'll get into later how it has benefited my life, but I wanted to fight. I wanted to be better at it. And uh, so uh, as a kid, it was just something that kind of occurred organically. And when I was 12, I, I got involved in traditional martial arts. Now, I, I, I was fascinated with the sword. Like, when I saw my first sword, it was, it was magical. I was, that, that is what I wanted to learn, no matter what. But in 19... Do you remember the, the, the first sword you saw? I don't. I, I don't. I, I don't. Okay. Probably on TV. I mean, there were, weren't a lot of them around. Probably on TV. Mm-hmm. But I remember thinking, that's incredible. I, I, you know, that's what I want to have and do. But uh, 19, 
81, 82, outside of what you heard about fencing, there wasn't really sword schools. So I started my martial arts career in Taekwondo, figuring that I'm my way up into uh, sword martial arts. But my driving goal was I wanted to win the fights that I was in. So I started martial arts thinking, I, I just want to be a better fighter. What did, what did fighting represent to you? W- winning, victory. Like okay. it, and I, it didn't matter whether I was climbing a cliff or going on a hike or, or whatever I was doing. I wanted not just to be the best out of whatever group that I was in, but the best at what I was doing. I wanted, I wanted perfection in absolutely everything I put my mind to. And uh, I, I can say, even as as an adult, I I that's in my everyday to this day. So it's a driving instinct of mine to really seek that. And you know, I've I've lost as many fights as I've won, if if not more. But I, I learned so much throughout that that process uh, of need and necessity. And so getting into martial arts, I. Again, this is the 80s. So when martial arts hit mainstream 80s, it was magical, mystical. You believed a black belt was could not be defeated. There's so much that surrounded that. So me uh, being awe-inspired to want to get involved, I was uh, insatiable uh, at that point. That drive for perfection, that's, mm-hmm. that's what I'm hearing. I don't know that you use that word, but just that that being the best it's something that I've seen with a lot of martial artists. It's something that I, I think we, as martial artists, don't so much cultivate, but we come in with that attitude. And then we find this thing that, hey, the harder I work at this, the better I get. And then I can continue to work harder and I can get better. And it's there are so few things like that in life where, uh, the way I like to put it, you get back exactly and only what you put in. Where did that mindset come from? Is that something that you learned from your parents or maybe encountered to your parents? Well, I, both of my parents were definitely driven people in their own regard and, and, and very opposite. They separated at an early age. You, you know, one was a classic a work. You work hard, very hard, two jobs. You're going to have everything you want, cars, house. And the other worked hard, but was complete family. Like my mother taught me, if you believe that you can do it, you're going to do it, period. Like, if you believe in yourself and you believe in achieving that dream, then it's going to happen. And that, that is definitely one of the forefronts of my character that I have to this day that sticks with me. And when, when you have one side of the family that's working hard, very hard, physically and the other side that works out for also believes in achieving your dreams beyond that. I think that I had the best kind of guides in that regard towards achieving what I set out to do. Tell us a bit more about your childhood. I, I think we got some pieces that we want to kind of Lego together. Well, it's going to be then, then, then very simple. I've been a daredevil okay. my whole life. I took a fall <laughs> at age eight. And I lost my memory mm. from age eight and below. So I have no idea what I did before age eight. <laughs> Between okay. age eight and age 12, you know, I went to school and I ventured around the small town of Milford, Connecticut, everywhere I possibly could. And friends, well, friendship was vastly important to me. It really was. So I made close bonds, some bonds that I, ha- I have. And I, it's going to be impossible for me to make it through our talk without bringing up two gentlemen, which is Rob and Joe. And there's several reasons because I met them when I was around 11 or 12 and then they were nine or 10 and, and we were all getting involved in martial arts at that time. And they are still my best friends to this day and still martial artists. So we have been friends for the same time that we've been studying martial arts 35 years and they kind of pushed me. So then you kind of, if you fast forward to my childhood, I went to school. I, 
I trained and I went to work. I started my first full-time job at 13. I've been working full-time ever since then when I wasn't in school and I wasn't at work. I would train an hour to two hours a day throughout most of my childhood. And half the time was with those two gentlemen. We were outside of the dojo. We had a lot of open space. We were training or sparring or uh, pursuing other martial artists. It's definitely varying uh, degrees of what we do. And I want to say that I perhaps had the best dojo in the world. Because in living in Milford, Connecticut, I, I had a beach, a mountain, a forest, an open area, places to climb, jump, balance, train. Uh, it, it was incredible. And we used it. We used everything like it was our dojo, everything that we could. Any way that we could make it harder to kick, punch, grapple, sword fight, we just did that. And uh, J- Joe, Joseph, he was a natural athlete and eventually uh, moved into some acting and voiceover, which he does professionally. And Rob was a gymnast trained for the Olympics for that time. And so I, I, my competitors were two incredibly competitive people who sought the same thing, the perfection and the drive. And it was like uh, iron sharpening iron throughout my childhood with these two. And the world of our friends that exist around us kind of circled around our drive for martial arts and adventure uh, all the way through my teens and beyond. It's certainly not uncommon for people to end up with some pretty solid friends from their time training. Mm. But for those people to remain such strong friends decades later, and all of them to continue training, that's pretty abnormal. So I'm wondering, was there there something that you can look back on in the early days that could have foreshadowed where you're all at today? Possibly. I, I mentioned that Friendship was important to me. And I think that as I, as I got involved in the sword at that time, and it's not something that I necessarily subscribe to right now, there was an ideal of honor. And honor in the sense of that it was almost mystical. And I believed that this is what your friend was, that they were like a brother to you. And that was how they should be treated. And however I came across that belief uh, initially, that it was ingrained in me, I I made it that reality. And then, of course, what happened is is it, it, it was nothing mystical. We spent so much time together growing up. I mean, you know, we we were pre high school. So that means we experienced everything that you're going to experience through high school and college. We experienced girls and marriages, and job loss, and death in the families, and death of our friends, all at the same time training in martial art. And these things bound us together. I mean, Rob has physically saved my life four times. Joseph and I have both saved our lives. And not like talk, like physically saved. So that's a, a kind of a, a bond that you form. And I, I can say that there's a level of trust that you have. And we've all had students now, obviously training so long. So you get to see the people that they associate with. And then those people will often become your, your friends. And that kind of bond gets stronger because instead of moving away and bear in mind, I live in the San Francisco area and Joseph lives nine hours away in the San Diego area and Rob lives in Florida and we still see each other regularly at competitions and just come to hang out and do so is that you have that bond, but also all of Rob's friends and extended family and all of Joe's friends and extended family kind of become mine because the community becomes so tight, especially around Kenjutsu. The art of the sword is, is big now, but what we do isn't so big. And what, when we were doing it back then in the eighties, nineties, it was incredibly small. So it kind of binds you together. All that aside, they are a pair of the two best men that I know. You know Joe, Rob, and a person named Nick. They, they're simply generous and honest. And there, 
you pick up the phone, you say, I need to see you. You don't have to give a reason, hang up, you know they're going to be on their next plane. They're that kind of people, and they always have been. That hasn't changed in three and a half decades. I'm wondering how often you reflect on this. Because when, when people come on the show, you know, there's a good mix of things that they say that are things they've said before, and sometimes there are things that they say and they say, you know, I haven't really thought of it that way. I can tell that you value and appreciate these two men, and I suspect they know that. But I'm wondering if you, you recognize the rarity of these bonds. Probably not. Like most okay. of my friends, I, I, <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a line, and it's ironic because I have, I, I have friends and I, I talk to associates of mine. And I, I kind of have a line. You're, you're either a friend or you're, or you're not a friend. You're a friendly and associate or you're associate. And I think a lot of people will make the mistake of they're friendly with somebody or they have a mutual connection either through martial arts class or work and they think they're their friend. And for me, that's, I, I don't. If you're my friend, I trust you. I respect you. It's mutual and you've earned it. And it is, it's not an easy thing. And I am not an easy person to be around. However, our talk will reflect me in any kind of positive light. There is the other side that we might not touch upon that is incredibly direct, very little empathy. And I expect the people that I'm around to share some of those absolute traits, that kind of dedication and honesty and drive and willingness. And I just don't put up with it when it's not there and we'll call it out. And I have lost friends by telling them, you're not my friend because you show no interest and things have changed and that's it. And it's, it's over. I call it out where other people just kind of let things Mm -hmm. fade away. I don't believe in that possibility. And then other times I've called people out and, and then we forge an even stronger bond where we've realized, well, wait a second, this is the kind of person that he is and he's expecting me to do this and he's willing to do it. Uh, he or she, and, and that happens. So I, mm. I I take it for granted in the sense that it it is the expectation that I think surrounds me and and kind of the blessing that I've got from other people that I consider to be my close friends. I, Rob and Joe are great, but I could give you a list of 10 other very close friends that operate in the, in the same manner that it requires no explanation if I needed them, they would be here. And sometimes even when I don't realize, and they do, they're here. And, and when we talk about honor, I don't believe that honor is something that really you can teach. I think it's something that grows in a person and is something that is by their actions. It's the actions of these individuals that has shown me that I they can be trusted and believed in and depended upon. And I strongly believe that we pick our friends in life as people that we can depend on. I don't see my friend as somebody that's going to hold me and tell me everything's going to be okay. I see my friend that's going to carry me when I have two broken legs that is going to tell me it's not going to be okay and you need to get off your path and get back in the fight. That's what I see out of of my friends, people that help me uh, throughout life, friends and family. This sounds very <sighs> militaristic. <laughs> that, that's not quite the right word, but it sounds, I, I have not, I did not serve. I have not served um, none of my direct family. You know, I don't have good stories. So a lot of my understanding of that brotherhood in the military comes from, you know, conversations with some friends and, and of course, media. But what you're describing really seems to line up with that, this, this, these very high standards and yet this dedication. Did you serve? Is I, I was part a, of your I, I was a cop, uh, and I am a bodyguard currently. And uh, I, I've also taught good friends that have served in the military as well. So I can see how it can come across in, in, that, in that manner. Because, I mean, if you're in the military and you take an oath or a law enforcement officer, you're saying that you're willing 
to give your life. And I, I taught the company that I currently work for. I taught their defensive tactics program to bodyguards for years. And I would always end my first meeting where if you're not willing to give your life for somebody you know nothing about, this is the wrong job for you. And I, I believe that. And I believe that that is something that has to be a part of the person. Like I, I couldn't teach them how to do that. I could teach them moves and theories. And just like I teach students, I can teach them moves and theories. I can't make them into a person that would suddenly stop their car and get out and save somebody from being beaten to death, right? That desire. I just, I know that I had that desire uh, growing up. I know that I respected that. And in Kenjutsu, when you get to the point where you're fighting steel, and even though the weapons are rebated, even though you're in armor, there can be a significant chance of injury and without control, you're holding the life of your partner in your hands every time you walk out to fight. And that forms a kind of bond. And I've had the honor and privilege of teaching veterans that have seen combat and, and talking in line with what they've seen versus what I saw as a peace officer. And I, I realized something that you just kind of mentioned, that it, there is a kind of bond. And I think that that bond in martial arts isn't dissimilar if you make it that way. Talk more about that. The bond itself or what martial arts brings into it. The martial arts aspect. You, you, okay. I feel like you could launch into a, an essay on that. <laughs> I feel like you're holding back on me. I, I, I could. It, it, it's, it's like this. Well, I'm sure we're going to get into this conversation where we talk about the Western Circle of Sword Fighters, and I can't reference one without the other. The group starts you out training with wood weapons, so you reach a certain level, and then you fight steel. And then you fight steel, and you fight steel predominantly throughout, and you'll use sharpened steel for various aspects, and you'll spar with the rebated weapons. But there is a a very big difference. The Western Circle allows drafting even to the face. It's one of the most dangerous things you can do with a steel sword. A lot of the steel organizations won't allow that. And they allow full contact as a means of fighting. And the ideal isn't point sparring. You're, you're there to defeat your opponent within the rules of respect. And you're allowed to use hand-to-hand combat. You're allowed to use, use daggers. And it's not supposed to be fair. If your opponent, you throw your opponent to the ground or they fall, you can allow them to get up if you want to, but you're just as expected as to defeat that person. And as merciless as that sounds, no one is likely to get in a sword fight out on the street. But what they can take from Kenjitsu and what I have taken, and this will lead directly into the bond, I assure you, is the immediacy of action. I, I've been in fist fights. I've Hard with gloves and a helmet, and, and I've done hand to hand and some jujitsu, and none of that really prepared me for the actual violence that I saw in mm-hmm. real life. And I always described violence as something that most people have been in a car crash; it happens immediately, and your whole world is crashing around you, and you have to act. And if you're trained, you're going to act on training. Well, kenjitsu is the only thing I've seen that does that, sword fighting. You're standing there one second, sword to sword, and then martial or the caden will say begin, the bell will ring, and then you're, you're going to fight. And that fight often lasts a second, a half a second, a second and a half, if a few blocks actually make it through, and then the steel sword crashes into you and it's over. And you realize in that mad second, your whole world has changed, your, your training. And if you do that enough, and you know enough about that person. You've gone to events, and you've, and they've done everything that they had to get to that point. That bond becomes natural. It's something that's shared. It's an understanding, and it's difficult to put the words in to say how you achieve it, and then not difficult. Most people that I have fought in steel, I I knew that I 
there was a level of trust. And the more we fought and the more dedication I saw from them, the more that, that bond formed. And then if you take that, if that is your core, and I have to sadly admit that 95% of my friends are martial artists, but the other 4% are bodyguards or cops, and then the other 1% somehow got involved with me. <laughs> so if you have that, if that's what you're surrounded by, then you add to the fact that you have mutual interests, that you have mutual friends, that they are respectful, that they are honest, that they are reasonably good people. Well, that bond becomes even stronger. And I would like to say that anyone that listens to this uh, radio show and considers me a friend knows that I am that person that they can call, that they share that bond, and that they know that without question. Because it's just some, it's a means of how I live my life every day. I would imagine that someone with such strong principles brings a lot of those standards and those expectations into their instruction. You, how, you, mm-hmm. how does that manifest? If, if I was to walk into your school, what might I experience that maybe would be a little, I'm guessing a little different from what other schools might do. Is it, are you stricter? You know, how, how does, what would I say? That's a great question. So I mentioned that I, I trained in, in in multiple martial arts, not very long. I have not had the two longest instructors I had, uh, Don Brandu and Sensei Cruley, were no more than a year. Other than that, I haven't had very long instruction. However, before training in the Dusatsu Kenjozu, Japanese dojo under Sensei Cruley, I had only experienced what I deemed a version of an instructor should be. And Goofing around was a lot of class. You could partner up with whoever, whoever you wanted to. Zero was kind of worried about who, who am I going to get, pick class. And you were kind of moved along with it. Or at the same time, I ran into somebody and I, I got in a street fight. It escalated very quickly. And I'm bleeding from my mouth. There was none of, none of that goofing around. And there was this, this there's something missing. When I walked in to this, traditional Japanese dojo and I casually stepped on the mat, I was screamed at. And there was no sign, don't step on the mat, I was screamed at. And I accepted it and I, I immediately began to learn the rules. But there was no talking while you're training. Classes were two hours, that you had to make eye contact when you spoke, and that you could only answer height or EA, yes or no, period. And that was there were no ums, there were no ahs. And any lack of confidence was called out in front of the whole class and there was no illusion and I loved it like I, I was like this is how I wish I had been training since I was 12 I had I wished that I was training that way so when you walk into my class whether you are a trainee and and there are seven attainable levels that that go from and L1 to L7 whether you are level one or you are level seven when you walk into my dojo the same expectation is there you will look me in the eye you will speak with confidence you'll answer my questions and you will know that if i am teaching you will do what i say when i tell you to do it and if you don't want to there's the door there is a choice and there isn't a choice when you're learning you have no choice but to do what you're told to do if you don't like that leave don't come back. It's simple. Because I deal in facts. I'm not going to teach you what my opinion of the universe is or, or bonds. But I'm not going to teach you that opinion. I'm going to teach you what I know to be the truth about that martial art. And I'm only going to teach you that. And my expectation is that you're going to give me everything that you have, that you are going to pursue that perfection while you're in my presence, and that you're, you will in turn grow from it. So I think the biggest thing that people run into is, is they will start talking to me and I will say, stop looking in the eye. And then I will say stuff like, there's no, um, there's no, ah, those are weak in between words. There's no, okay. There either is, or there is not. 
so they're brought into this harsh reality that they're not learning how to hold a sword. They're learning how to walk and how to communicate in a manner that displays them as confident and strong as much as possible. Everything that they need to survive in a fight or a sword fight. And I think that's like the biggest reality. For example, the Western Circle is not for profit. So none of the instructors, there's five or six schools, take any money for teaching. They volunteer their time and they teach. That said, no one just walks into a class. It's by invitation only. And you have to watch for two weeks. Just watch. After you watch for two weeks, then you're allowed to participate for two weeks. Then you're taken aside. And at that point, you've gone over the website, you've watched, you've seen the teaching methods, you're asked to say, is this what you really want to do? And if not, in hard feelings, then have a nice life. But if it is, then you're expected to make it to level two, green three. To make that dedication to say, I am willing to commit that, that this is my goal and I will do what necessary to get there. How would younger you have responded to you as an instructor? I would have thought that I could have beaten me. Oh, oh, not even close to the answer I expected. Okay, wow. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 I <laughs> no, always... no, that's 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 good. That's good. I like when stuff comes out of left field because it means we're we're going to learn something really big about you. Why? There's... Why would you have thought that? Well, I, I don't know if you could blame my mother, my father, or me. I believe there was nothing that I couldn't do. I have never okay. met a sword fighter I couldn't defeat. Maybe not the first time, but there's never been anybody that I found that I couldn't beat. It just was a matter of time. And so, uh, granted, you know, twelve-year-old me would have lost. Eighteen-year-old me would have lost. Thirty-year-old me would have, would have wouldn't even wouldn't have even stood a chance. But I would have believed, looking in in my eyes and hearing those things, one that I could do this. But but my Behind my mind, behind saying height can gas, I would be thinking, I will beat you. Might not be today or tomorrow, but I'm going to win. It's inevitable. That would have been my thought. And that's a mindset that you've had with everything. To some degree. Unfortunately, yes. Well, and, I mean, maybe it's fortunate, maybe it's unfortunate. And the, and the reason I'm I'm kind of poking at that a little bit is because I can relate. Great. It doesn't mean necessarily you're the best on every day, but it means that given enough time, given research, your own intelligence, your own experience, you can devise a strategy to overcome whatever the obstacle is. Uh, that is, that, is, is that a fair assessment? Uh, that's an exact assessment. I, I, okay. I don't believe. I believe that you lose when you're dead or when you give up. That's when you lose. Like that's it. Because if you've lost something, it doesn't mean you should stop. You keep fighting. You keep trying. If you're dead, you're dead. Then you have an acceptable excuse for losing. Other than that, there is nothing. When I was in the police academy, they taught me a profound thing that stuck with me in life. And they said that cops have died from bullet wounds that were not technically deadly, from shock or just from giving up. And cops have survived bullet wounds, stab wounds that should have killed them. And that just linked up with everything that I believed about fighting. In the Western Circle, if you fall down and you cry out because you got a bruise and you're like, I'm injured, my, my first comment is, are you injured? Do we need to call 911? Or are you just bruised and you're whining? Because if you need to leave, by all means, crawl out of the sparring circle or leave. If you need medical attention, we'll give you medical attention. And most people have never been treated that way. They've been treated like, oh, oh my God, you got a bruise. Let's check it out. Let's make sure. They need to realize that if they're in a situation, combat situation, that they have to assess. And they will assess and they'll have that drive. And I tell people, I don't care if you show up for the fight mad, glad, sad. I don't care if you scream in combat, providing you're not ever changing the consent of fighting, the sparring into malicious that you're making me an intent to hurt the same token if you start crying while you're fighting go ahead and cry right but fight fight whatever you do you you fight because that is what life feels you when you're going to have to fight 
for whatever you're going to have to fight for, and this is physical, you're generally not going to pick this time. And you can't stop because something hurts or because you're really sad. So it it is driven in part of it. And there is that that personality where hanging out with Kate and Gad in a martial art environment is great. Hiking is okay, but not so much on a barbecue or where you want to stay on the trail when you're hiking or there's that thing you really don't want to do. And he believes that we absolutely have to do it. We have to do it then and it has to be perfect. And and, and there's the, the, the drawback of that personality. Have you ever pushed yourself too far? When you look at, at this attitude, because I, I this attitude, I'm going to set this up because I've got a feeling where you're going. I, I understand this. I think you and I are similar in this way, but not all the audience is. So when you look at these really high standards and this drive to be the best, sometimes that can lead to some unhealthy patterns. It can lead to some damaging events. And I'm wondering if you've got any of those that you might talk about. Uh, I'm sure that the people who listen to this that know me would be raising their hand for a whole bunch of times <laughs> having been around me at times where I've pushed myself and uh but they are incredibly rare there are two and and they are are more recently that I can assess one is and I I you're going to have to put up with some of the things you're going to have to have background in the western circle there are seven levels of wood, seven levels of steel, and a lot like other martial arts, you have to do things. You've got to learn moves. You have to have time in. You have to have a certain amount of matches. You have to know some katas. You have to know all those things. Well, I helped found the organization, and so I, I've, I've done it. I've done it all, you know, all but one level in steel. I've done every proficiency. I've done every level. And then there are other levels the Western Circle respects, that's three levels uh, black blade, black chain, black ring. And then there are things that are called training contracts. And these contracts are a lot like a, a college semester, so to speak, where you get a course, coursework, over a six month, uh, uh, let's say a, they range from three months, to six months, a year to two years, and the average is six months. So you have this contract and it's written out generally by your cadence you sign it and you try to achieve these goals. You practice five days a week, fight 500 matches, make 10,000 full circle cuts, practice 10 hours of cutting, work out three days a week for your endurance. Like they're made up of things that you don't get in class because a class student, they, they go to class and they receive two hours of sessions and then the other cage would say, great, I want you to train at least two times a week outside of class. And you go and do that. And that's the average life of somebody practicing kenjutsu and uh that's it but then there's other people they want to get better so they have contracts that they take and and since i have completed all the western circle requirements and uh, other requirements and other organizations i am constantly seeking other ways to push myself and so i seek training contracts and some i'll write myself and give to other instructors that i respect and i'll add to it and They'll be my mentors and they'll hold me accountable so that I pass them. And recently, last year, I, I created a contract and the contracts are often have names to them. And, and I named this the way of the evening blade. And it was all about fighting. I, be, I believe you should spend approximately 60% of your time training to fight and about 40% of your time sparring or competing. And, and you need to have that balance. And I want it, and I have believed that for a very long time. I wanted to, I wanted to see if maybe I was wrong. And if you just sparred, that you would get good enough. We, the Western Circle has a competition this year called the Best of the Best. Let's do a competition. Fighters come from all over the country, and they fight to see who's the best fighter. And uh, they have to fight everybody. Everybody gets a circle. So if I'm in the circle, I fight the other 15 competitors and then I step out and when their circle comes up, I step in and I fight them once in their circle. So 
roughly 30, 35 matches. And the winner is the one that has the highest victory percentage. In essence, the person that has won the most. So three months prior to that, I designed a contract that was 1,000 matches in 100 days. And I thought, well, yeah, seems possible. And it, it, it was, it was un, it was unreasonable. The amount of training that I had to put in, the amount of sparring that I had to actually do in the art of the sword was incredibly intense. And at, at the end of it, I remember thinking this was too much. And I, actually printed up the contract, which I do in the Dojo. I have a library of, of my contracts and every contract every student's ever taken. And I actually put a lock on it so that no student would open it and be like, wow, this is a great idea. That was a terrible idea. It was completely off balance. It was focused on one thing only, sparring. It was dangerous because I kept thinking, I've had 50 matches. I'm exhausted. I need to do 25 more. That's not wise. You're exhausted. You need to stop. So you don't get hurt. You don't hurt and it 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 was just so heavily focused on victory and fighting that it threw out the window the core structure that you need to be practicing these cuts and these moves. And the only thing that I was practicing besides fighting people was better moves to use in combat, specific moves, and uh, then some movement exercises. And then other than that, I, I took a recent challenge to try to make 100,000 cuts in uh, 30 days. And I wound up uh, tearing out part of my shoulder muscle and uh, was convinced by two very close friends that it was time to stop. So that was obviously too much. Other than that, I can't think of any other single times in my life that I pushed myself too far. If anything, not far enough. Mm. Well, talk about that 100,000 cuts. That's... I just did some pretty quick math and there's not a lot of time to sleep in there. Yeah. Well, it's about, you know, 4,000 cuts a day. And, and what I was doing is I would get up, I'd, I'd make a series of cuts. And then I, while I was working, I would set a timer. So I would step aside and then I would make some more cuts. And, and then of course, we're how, how many, how many at a time? It would range from a hundred to two to 300. I would say that would be the, either range of what it would be now granted that didn't last very long i'm the sense that i started on june 17th and i started on june 20th and completed 12,200 cuts and during that time period before it was obvious that i was just damaging damaging an injury in my mind it, it seemed reasonable and then it, it was like this is not reasonable i i was thinking I'm just going to switch to my left hand and do it one handed. And then two very close friends were thinking, we're saying, no, you shouldn't. And I, I do have a rule. I, I live by some rules. And one of the rules is this to the people in this world, you trust the most tell you the same thing. Listen. And I listened. So instead of just switching to my left hand, trying to force something that I shouldn't, I stopped. I, I stopped doing something I said that I was going to do. How did that feel? At, at first, it felt uh, like I had failed, and and then it felt like I had I succeeded because I I also did the other thing I said that I was going to do. I, I took the advice of two people I trust. So it was a contradiction, but I'll tell you what really pulled it together. The other seventh level swords and Joe Joseph, who I mentioned earlier, had heard about this and heard about my decision about a week later, and he's like. He told me that he was impressed. He said, he's like, Dad, for you, completing a contract or doing something, that isn't hard. Quitting, giving up, that is hard when you did that. And I guess I felt a little better at that point because for me, there's not a whole lot between failure and success. But there should be because there's life. And Herring respected swordsman like himself was many accomplishments both in martial arts and in life so i respect the accomplishments in life to say that it really meant something it was powerful it's Thanks. you know one of the things that 
I think folks with very high standards, type A, I will overcome any obstacle sort of personalities suffer from is knowing when it is advantageous to step back. That there are times when a retreat might compromise ego, but be beneficial in every other way, even the ultimate goal. And that's something that I'm getting better at. I'm not even going to say I'm remotely good at it, but it's something that I'm, I'm learning as I age through stories similar to the two that you just shared. Oh, thank you. So I, I'm not surprised that, that uh, you're also developing that as, as you age. Trying. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked a bit about your school. And, I, and I'd like to talk more about it because you're doing some things that are, that are really interesting. You know, the, and not, not that any one of them is, is unique, but the combination of all of them seem to be pretty unique. So, um, you know, remember, you're, you're speaking to martial artists from, from all over the world, all different styles, some of whom are going to be roughly familiar with weapon work, with sword work. And I'd like you to offer up some some comparisons you know and, and i don't mean in, in a, a pro con way by any means but if you know you talked about what that initial entry point might be you know you've got to watch and there's a conversation and then you know and, and then you get to play so talk to us from that that angle no problem the western circle of sword fighters was founded approximately 25 years ago by myself and a few other martial artists that there simply wasn't a lot of sword fighting out there. Hino wasn't doing much. There wasn't a League of Nations and there wasn't a tremendous amount of Boken schools out there. There was the SCA and we of course trained in that. And the SCA, there are a lot of really lovely, kind people in it, but the sword fighting itself it is incredibly accurate. And I understand they have hundreds of thousands of fighters and they have strict insurance regulations and, and they have done well with Rutan for, for years. But for us, it, it wasn't close enough. And, you know, having a taste of traditional Japanese martial arts, I, there was a void. In, in the Japanese, very strict lineage has been the they started training, but one of the things they've always lacked is they would spar with a boken, a wooden sword, with no armor, with control, or they would spar with armor, with a bamboo sword, a shinai. And there was almost no in between. And the steel was unheard of. And we wanted to sword fight, to steel fight. So the organization was designed for the ultimate goal to get you to the point where you could hold a steel sword, a real steel sword, the edges rebated, a tip brought down to one inch, and wear armor, and to be in a fight. And not for the purpose of getting a point. So you win a match by striking your sword into an area. If a person was not wearing armor, that would be lethal. And again, this is another area where we differ. It's full contact, but it's not as much about the force you use. It's where you hit. You don't win a match because you hit somebody in the neck. You win a match because your sword would have severed their carotid artery. You don't win a match because you've severed somebody's upper arm. You win a match because you've severed their brake artery. Same thing with the leg. You hit somebody in the leg, and that's how the match ends. No, you use the right angle, and it severed the femoral artery and they lost blood pressure they were incapacitated you thrust in the aorta or the heart or massive blood vessel or an organ therefore you achieve incapacitation or death so the organization quickly formed a means that a person could safely get to the point where they could train that way so you come into the western circle starting with boken obviously because you have to learn you know, what even a wood sword, as you know, being a martial artist and anybody listening, you can take a 
a wood sword of any kind and strike it in somebody's neck or head and kill them instantly, probably using mid-contact force. So you take a person and you start them learning the techniques, learning control, and you put them in the armor and they start by fighting an instructor, a Caden, and then they learn what is and isn't a killing blow. And they move through that and they move through the ranks starting at green braid and white rope. And then at red rope, they have about a year or two years in the Western circle. And they're allowed to start training with steel. They get safe lessons. They have, it starts over. They, they have matches with an instructor and they begin to fight. And then the world opens up to them because what a Boken can't really teach you is yes, it hurts a lot. And you can feel the mass of it when it hits you in armor and unarmored spots. But the sword, even with a rebated edge, even hitting you light contact in some armored areas, you feel through your armor. Mid contact, you feel. And full contact is, is devastating, even in the very hard, hardest parts of your armor. And it opens your eyes to just how deadly the, the sword is and, and how realistic that can be. So a lot of organizations have tried to do the same thing. They've tried to, to put a weapon in somebody's hand, prevent the other person from dying, and get as realistic as they could. And in some cases, that's points. In other cases, it's called armor for armor factor, like the the SDA where you get hit and then that person determines if you hit them hard enough or the league of nations where that person either hit you more and throws you to the ground or, or beats you into submission. The Western circle has chosen the path to say we were armored to protect ourselves, but you're fighting somebody that's unarmored. So what would happen if you took your sword and you made it through? Not every blow is killing or incapacitating. It's not. The blade turns where you hit isn't vital in that same second. So they're taught to be very accurate what you're doing, how they're targeting. And you're, you're told you can strike as hard as you fast as you like with control. That means that the armpit is not a very well-protected area. So it shouldn't be an area that you target with a thrust with a steel sword. And if you were to continue to do that, you'd, you know, you'd be warned that would be bad. One area that we never target is the back of the head. And obviously that's where the brainstem is and the cervical vertebrae. And there could be a space between the gorget and the helmet or the armor. And even with a boken, there is no room for error. So that's probably the one place in the Western circle you can't get. Otherwise, based on level, base thrusting, striking to the hands, everything is legal, except in fighting. And if you are a big guy and you're fighting a small guy that's better than you with the sword you just lock up with him you pick him up you throw him down and you can use hand to hand to defeat him or your dagger it's about strategy and, and overcoming that so in the western circle it doesn't matter if you're 70 it doesn't matter if you're a girl or a guy or or what your experience is it comes down to what you can do and what you can't do with the sword and what you want out of it not everybody wants to be the greatest sword fighter that ever lived. Other people want better discipline. They, they want the structure. They want to get that kind of training from class. And I think the Western Circle does that great because I believe that the instructor doesn't teach the class. He teaches the individual. Because, you know, you asked what I would be like if I was in that class. And if I had to teach me, I would know that that guy needed to be constantly pushed. He needed contracts, needed extra work. On the other hand, I, another person might need just to get in better physical conditioning or another person just really wants that once a week balance and they're getting something out of it. And then somebody else moves into the business professional world and, and they want the confidence to be able to speak with their boss or other executives. And the sword, it it builds that in the class. It builds that confidence in you that you can accomplish things. And that it's not that you should believe in yourself. You must believe in yourself because you're going to be called out. Your, your weaknesses are going to be right there in front of you. And, and a, every Caden teaches in what is the harshest way. You are not very 
kind or thoughtful when somebody makes a mistake. It's not, oh, you need to correct your cut. That was the worst cut I've ever seen in my life. Now do it right. It was terrible. I mean, get yourself off the concrete and get in the fight or get out of the dojo. And again, some people are kind of shocked and then they realize, wait a second, everything he says, the way he moves, the way he looks at me, the way he talks, it has a purpose. And that purpose is to help me improve. It's not to degrade me. It's not to beat me down. It's to say that in these kinds of environments, there is no in-between. And so in the Western Circle, you will, and you can check out the website, westerncircle.org, and it breaks down all the physical requirements, how many moves you need to know, the kata that you will learn, the amount of matches that you have to fight in between the different levels, what levels you can fight steel, and that's the basic outline of what you would learn. And you join one of the classes, and they take you through those requirements. You're guided through it. You're given basic training on what to do when you're training on your own. And it, it progresses from training all the way up through seventh level. There's roughly 100 participants, um, a few different states. Most of the dojos are actually in California. And then throughout the year, there are events, like tournaments that are held. And tournaments are for people to get together and fight from other schools. And as I mentioned, one tournament per year is set to determine who is the best sword fighter in the Western Circle. And that's a basic breakdown of how it works. It's a nonprofit organization, so instructors don't make any money. They volunteer their time. They generally will train out of a open space or they will have built a dojo. I have demands as the head caden, and there's a council of sword fighters that sets the requirements of the Western Circle that I'm not a part of. And my requirements of the cadence is that it, it can't be a backyard. They have to, if they're going to use their backyard to teach, it needs to be devoid of debris and anything that would visibly distract from training. It should be corded off so nobody can walk in and out, just like you would walk to a dojo that has a mat. And you should inspire, inspire others. And so in doing so, you create a space that is both safe to train in and as the student looks around they think ah, this is this is where I want to be and that that stems from my training in Shinkage Ryu is they their dojos were mostly outside and inside I had inside portions for certain training but they preferred to teach sword fighting outside as do I but that training space was a training space and that is is Violently important. I mean, I, I'm not opposed to somebody going in a park and training with a sword, not at all, especially if that's how they can train. If that's, that's what they have, or they're going to make the best of it. But in the Western Circle, we really strive to say if, if you're going to dedicate a section of training, and if, if it's a rented space downtown or if it is a portion of the property that you own, you, that portion is dedicated to training. So taken seriously from the cadence all the way down to the student. Right on. Sounds like a great place, and uh, no surprise. I'm, I'm. I wish it was closer. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be there. I'd be there. It sounds awesome. Imagine we did a follow up to this conversation twenty years from now, mm -hmm. and I asked you, "What happened since our last talk? What would you hope you would be able to say?" Only that things remained refined, and the martial art grew and adapted. I believe that you should honor your tradition. They can remain, but that if there is better armor, better swords, or better ways to do things, that the council would bring these in, that the martial art would adapt to be more efficient, be, to be better, that it would grow in that regard. It doesn't matter if there's 100 people or 1,000 people or 50 in the Western Circle. It would just matter that the core ideals and traditions remain the same, and the art continued to become refined, better for everybody's sake. You mentioned the website. Uh, is there social media? Is there any other way people might follow along with what you're doing? Western Circle has a website, and they have an Instagram. The council will post photos and so forth. 
and it has a means of contact uh, at westerncircle.org. You can ask questions and see if there are Cajuns that have moved. And unfortunately, I don't think there are any that moved to your area, but you know, they might have mentioned there's a guy in Florida and there's some in Washington and Oregon that may have moved and are looking to take on one-on-one -on -one students so they can stay in contact in, in that regard. And I think that's, uh, that's really it. My, I don't have, my personal Instagram is surrounded around my, my book. So um, people have reached out to me because you know, there's sword fighting pictures on there as well. Talk about your book for a minute. Cool. I, people, people might want to know. Um, I'd be happy to. And I can't talk about my book without talking about the sword. Because next to the sword, writing the book has been the hardest, one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's, and it's discipline. It's a discipline of writing. So I directly use the discipline from training in the art of the sword to sit down in front of my computer and write and finish a book. And the, the book is almost in complete contrast to everything that we have discussed a story about a warrior and a vampire. It's a fantasy novel and it's a fun kind of adventure story. I, I will say that the sword fighting in it is incredibly realistic and terrific and that the writing is moves along at a reasonable place. It's called The Curse of Raven's Rose Keep and it talks about a warrior who, who's done fighting and he receives a lordship and castle and he moves into that castle in his lands, and uh, he has, as you read the book, whether you think the fortune or misfortune of meeting a female vampire and where that whole adventure takes him. And uh, it, of course, is available on, on Amazon. But I, what I, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to read, so I love audiobooks. I'm always listening in some regard to some kind of audiobook. So I had the book made into an audio book. So people have the option now to listen to it. It's voiced by Elizabeth Clett, terrific voiceover artist. And you can download it and listen to 13 hours talking about uh, adventures of this warrior and travels. And I will say that uh, through my profession as a bodyguard and in my my life my desire to see the world i've i've traveled all over the world and i brought that into the book so like the scenery that you will either read about or listen to are from different parts of the world whether you know there are some forests in england or cliffs in ireland or mountains in scotland they are from actual places that i have been so in writing it i brought it into it just like the sword fighting I wanted it to have a sense of realism and a sense that you could go there or you could be there and, and experience these things. And then I put in things that I always would want, secret passages and castles, for example, and, and adventures, so things that I, I personally, hey, I, I'm the author, I'm, I'm going to insert this in there. And it's not a training manual or the art of the sword. And, Although some martial artists might find some of the strategies and combat interesting, it's, it's probably not for your average martial artist that they think they're going to get something out of it. But it is a fast-moving adventure story. And for me, it has represented that I, I've taken the sword, I've taken martial arts, and it's given me the drive to write this novel become an executive in the firm that I work for now and purchase a house to travel the world. Like I think that, and I believe that martial arts gives back to you. You, you put into it and it gives back, to you. it gives you that drive, that, that discipline. So the book represents a kind of like an achievement in, in the art of the sword. And on the other hand, being an, being an author, I'll say this is, it's, it's rare that I suffer from any kind of imposter syndrome. My ego is too vast for that. But I wrote this book a lot like I do anything, and I finished it. And it was published, and, it, and it's been around for a while. But I, I never felt like an author until I was at a, a small book signing I was doing, and I was sitting there, and, and you know, I have a book, and, and uh, I 
high school age girl comes up and she says, can you tell me about the curse of Raven's Ghost Deep? And I do. And she's like, and she's like, and I want you to know I'm, I'm an aspiring author. And could you give me advice? And I, I want to say don't because, you know, most people don't finish and, and, and it's really hard, but I, I'm, I'm not Kate and Gad. I'm, I'm an author. I'm a person. And, I shouldn't be crushing people's dreams. So I'm like, yeah, I'll give you honest advice. And to my surprise, she opens this notepad and she has like a series of questions. She asks me these questions of, you know, what was the hardest thing? And I told her writing, you write a page every day, whether you use it or you don't use it, you do that. How do you make the time? She's like, you know, I have school, I have homework. I'm like, well, go to bed 10 minutes or later, get up 10 minutes earlier. You, you, you can make the time. She said, well, what about, you know, the ideas? What happens when I don't have an idea? What should I write? Think about the thing that you like the most and write about that. When you can't write about anything, even if it's out of line, and it's not going to happen for, you know, ages in the book, write about what makes you the happiest and that will help get you through it. And then reach out to other writers online and, and help kind of break. And at the end of it, the conclusion was, is like I felt like for the first time I had accomplished something outside of the sword in that regard and that might touch a person that might become a writer. And whether she becomes famous or not, she'll write and she'll finish a book and a dream will be achieved. Because like to me, whatever that dream is, whatever it is, it, it's never too small and it's never too big. You set your mind to do it and you do it, you should be proud of it should be proud of accomplishing that, that dream. And for me, certainly writing the book was a dream. And I was uh, you know, very glad that I could accomplish it, and make publication, get it into Audible. This has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed talking about the, the wide world that we traveled around. As any of our listeners know, we, we go into some interesting places and, and based on our, our kind of pre-conversation, pre-interview, I had no doubt that this would be another one of those. So I just want to ask you for one more thing as we, as we head out, as we set up the outro that I'll record later, I want to leave it to you. You know, how do you want to close out this part of the conversation? Maybe some final words, some wisdom, some, some whatever, you know, what, what do you want to leave the audience with? I would say believe, believe in yourself, believe in what you're doing, what you want to accomplish and don't be afraid to allow people to help you achieve those goals. Some really good stuff in there today. A combination of experiences and stories and I guess spirit. It's pretty uncommon and possibly the first time we've had anything like this on this show. I hope you enjoyed it. Kane Gad, I hope you had a great time on the show and I hope to talk to you soon. If you want more Head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every episode has a page all to itself with links and photos. We put a transcript up and sometimes there's even more. So go check it out. And if you want to support us, if you're willing to contribute to what we're doing, you've got some choices. You can make a purchase using Podcast 15 to get 15% off at whistlekick.com. You could also leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help with the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, N. If you see somebody out in the wild wearing something with a whistle kick on it, maybe a shirt or a hat, say hello. Talk to them. Make a new friend. If you have suggestions, including guests, let me know what they are. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and our social media is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 